Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host Will and today I'm joined by Comrade Humphreys and Dee Fari to talk about what it's like to sail around the world. Welcome guys, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having us. So before we get started, we usually ask our host, our guest, a random ocean question. Uh, So your question today is what is your favourite sea creature and why? Who wants to start? Well, I'm going to say an albatross. We probably both love albatrosses, but yes, my favourite sea creature is an albatross. And why? And why? Uh, Just because they've formed lifelong partnerships. They are the most incredible, majestic birds and they seem to enjoy solitude. (laughs) That's quite lovely. I love that. So he chose albatross, so I'm going to be a bit more stereotypical and say the dolphin. Good choice. I never tire of seeing dolphins when I'm out at sea. And for me, it's a sign if everything's been a bit full on or I've had some issues, if the dolphins are there playing in the bow wave around the boat, it's a sign that everything's going to be okay. Both solid choices. So I think you said so. I'm kind of joined by British sailing royalty, I think. <laughs> if I, I, just, I just want to reel off a few stats just because you've both got really impressive sort of back catalogues. So you both sailed around the world multiple times. Dee, you're the first woman to single-handedly and non-stop sail around the world in both directions. Uh, Comrade, you're the youngest winning skipper of the BT Global Challenge. You both completed the legendary Vendée Globe. So do you want to do you want to start with how sort of where it all started? So how did you get into sailing? Or how young were you when you realised that you wanted to, to do what you've done? Well, I'm not your average sailor as in I didn't grow up sailing I was all about dance classes and you know nothing to do with the water and actually so I was a very late bloomer came into sailing very late I was at university doing a sports science degree and I majored in outdoor activities and part of that module was sailing right so we went to the west coast of Scotland and sailed there in the outer hebrides fell in love with it Um, Then trained as a dinghy instructor while at university and did my yacht master at night school because I I knew I had a passion for it, but then went into teaching and I spent five years as a secondary school teacher. And then I did the big career change, went to UKSA on the Isle of Wight, retrained and at 27 started my sailing career. I just fitted a lot in in a short space of time. Comrade? But slightly different. So uh, I grew up a stone's throw away from Exmouth Beach. I had a rugby club 100 metres that way and a sailing club on that side and seemed to be drawn to the sailing in the summer and rugby in the winter. Uh, we had a really competitive cadet class club there, um, producing some of the top cadet sailors in the country. And I uh, was part of a sort of cohort that went through, did sort of multiple world championships. And, uh, and then... I, I probably was the first person to venture offshore in a little 10-foot cadet because we didn't have a car. So the right. closest open meeting I could sail to was Torquay. So I, I took my cadet from Exmouth to Torquay. And then I remember calling my mum up saying, I'm in Torquay. And she dispatched her brother to, on his motorbike to come pick me up at the age of 14. So that was probably my first offshore <laughs> in a cadet. Um, but it was actually, I was at the Junior World Championships in Holland where right. a, um, a youth team that had newly formed, asked if I'd like to join them for a race called the Whitbread Round the World Race. Wow. And, uh, just, just a little race. A little Would race. Like so I went from sailing a cadet, 10 foot cadet, to doing the Whitbread. So how old, would you, how old <laughs> were you when you did the whip, first did the Whitbread? 19. Wow. So uh, yeah, 19, tw- uh, 1920, 1993, 94. And uh, there were two Ukrainian teams in the Whitbread. Um, So if you cast your mind back, probably before your time, actually, (laughs) Will, but uh, if you cast your mind back to uh, when Ukraine got its independence from the former Soviet Union 30 years ago, then, uh, yeah, around that time, there were two Whitbread teams taking part, and I ended up sailing with one of the two Ukrainian teams. Wow. It's really interesting, like, the contrast in sort of how you both became. Did you you have any inspirations, like, when... Yeah, I mean, I think uh, having got the Whitbread sort of under my skin, I mean, it was the four years after Sir Peter Blake had dominated the uh, the race in, in, in Big Red. And he was, you know, not just an incredible leader, went on to become, a, you know, an amazing um, sort of environmentalist. Uh, but yeah, he was a total hero for me, I remember seeing him on the dock in New Zealand um, 
we were racing up against uh, his nemesis, Grant Dalton, and uh, just thinking, I'd love to be in this world. And so, yeah, followed that path. That, I mean, for you to start at 19, that's just not, not possible. For most 19-year-olds, it's not possible. You know, there's very few options for a 19-year-old to jump on a round world race. The, the, and had there not been this youth team right. back then, um, that would have never happened. I mean, there was actually a youth team and a disabled team that right. that, that joined forces because of funding. Um, but otherwise, there was no. And there was, of course, there was an all women's team. So um, you know, but they were there was a big period in between, uh, in after that, where nothing like that really mm -hmm. happened again for some years. Wow. Yeah. Um, for, for me, it's funny that Conrad mentions to Peter Blake, but right. you know, I've read his book, lived, like, felt like I've lived his experiences, and and it's a massive driving force. He was so influential and had such a reach from America's Cup and galvanising a nation to get behind him with the infamous Red Sox to support Team mm -hmm. New Zealand, to round the world, to Jules Verne records, to then exploring um, Antarctica and going up the Amazon before his demise. And I've been lucky enough to know the family. And Lady Pippa Blake was actually the godmother to my Vendée Globe oh, wow. and launched her. So she's always kind of been there along my round the world. Yeah. And I sailed my last ocean race um, on Turn the Tide on Plastic. I had um, his son on board as my onboard wow. reporter, documenting it all. So James Blake was on board. And so we sailed into New Zealand and Lady Pippa Blake was wow. there to meet us. So it was, it was really it must nice. must be amazing to be able to go through that, but then knowing Peter Blake was sort of the person that inspired you, but then to have And they get it. They know what you're yeah. going through and they've lived it and seen it and yeah. experienced it. So that's really nice. But also now as a female sailor and the, it's a very male-dominated environment to battle that. You know, I remember the Whitbread leaving Ocean Village and Maiden being talked about and the iconic images of the girls like battling in and the competition between um, Dalton and Tracy, you know, if the girls team ever win, you know, I'm going to walk around with a pineapple <laughs> put somewhere. And um, he did have to walk around with a pineapple because oh, yeah. they did win the leg. <laughs> and, you know, things like that, you're just like, oh, it is possible. Yeah. There is an opportunity. Yeah. And I realise now that I'm probably the person that younger girls are looking at to yeah. see, oh, there is a pathway, there is a role yeah. model. And so I feel like the baton's being passed yeah, on. Yeah, definitely. That's really inspiring. So obviously when sailing around the world, so you obviously got the races and then I guess just choosing to sail around the world and try and do a record. So when, you, when you're looking at like long distance sailing, how does the plan, how does sort of the plan form? I mean, obviously race is slightly different, but what what goes into sort of planning something like sailing around the world? I think it's a big question. Yeah, yeah. Than the I mean, yeah. Yeah. I get most people don't realise this, but actually, you know, getting to the start of these races is is everything. You know, yeah. there, there are many more people that try and fail to whether it's raising the money, you know, building a team around uh, around you. You know, it, 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 I'm when I wanted to do the the Vendée Globe, there was a sort of a there wasn't there's not a clear pathway to that route particularly in the uk and france there is you know if you're talented in france there's a very clear pathway yeah um whereas in the uk you know most of the vendee globe sailors have come from quite sort of disparate backgrounds you know not sort of through a traditional pathway um and so it's quite hard to navigate that it's quite right. hard to really how are you going to ask you know i remember going to an american company and asking them you know for five million pounds to do the Vendée Globe. They couldn't even say Vendée. They didn't even know where the Vendée was. And yet in France, you know, it's, it's a very, very different story. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the planning starts with raising the money. Yeah. And then everything else kind of gets taken care of after, after you've yeah. solved that big issue. Mm. And, and it's a risk, you know, racing around the world, sailing around the world, adventuring around the world. There is an inherent risk. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you have almost um, given your returns before you even cross the start line yeah. so that just in case something happens, it's yeah. not all doom and gloom. And you cross the start line almost relieved of, oh, thank God for that. You know, the hard bit's done. Now I can actually enjoy yeah. the bit that I want to do. Yeah. And then you worry about it all when you come yeah. back in across the right. finish line, all being well. Yeah, so, so once that's all done, sort of 
say, start of the race, what are those first few hours, few days like at sea? Like, does it take a lot of getting used to? I mean, obviously, you guys have found I got, a I've lot got of time. Two, but... two very dis- different stories. So, with the BT Global Challenge, I remember being in, in the Solent, Southampton, the night before the start, um, actually having real self doubt really? about whether I was capable of leading a team around the world. Um, and despite the fact that I'd already been around, I was actually the, the only skipper that had previously done around the world race. Right. Um, I just didn't feel I had enough leadership experience. And I was surrounded by actually quite a lot of leaders on the boat, which can be quite intimidating. Um, so I actually felt quite isolated right. before the start, um, but just needed to kind of grow in confidence during the race. Whereas the start of the Vendée Globe, uh, I, I felt like I had the skills to be able to do it, but I hadn't, you know, really amassed very much solo yeah. experience, single-handed experience. So, um, so yeah, a lot of lot of nerves before the yeah. start, but then actually the sailing part is easier than the stuff that goes really? before it. And if you've already got there and raised the money and yeah. got the team together actually you're quite well prepared to, yeah. to take on a round the world race yeah for my Vendée Globe it was almost the other way around because I'd done the global challenge and then I'd gone round what's considered the wrong way on my own so I spent six months on my yeah. own at sea so I knew I could do the on my own yeah. bit I was worried whether I could step up and race on this professional circuit you know against the best in the world I was like have I got what it takes and I remember at going down the Atlantic and Michel Desjoyeaux, who is called the professor in France, you know, because he dominates and he had won before and he went on to win that edition as well. But he sent me an email and he was like, don't forget to turn left. And I was just really excited. He knew who I was, yeah. but he was just worried that I was going to go the wrong way again. Right. And I was like, no, not this time. But it's, it's, you know, every race has a different emotion attached to it. And, you know, the wrong way around. I hadn't even lived on my own before I sailed around right. the world on my own. Wow. And, you know, I, to learn to live with yourself 24-7 yeah. is actually quite hard, yeah. especially when there's no interaction. Yeah. You realise you're not that funny yeah. or, you know, there's suddenly 24 hours in the day to fill. And then you learn a lot about yourself. It's a, a very much a big personal journey. So actually I'd done that hard bit before I then yeah. went on the Vendée Globe. So then I was much more did you able feel, to be emotionally did you feel stable. Like, like I was going to say, like, the, the mental aspect of it. So, like, obviously, Cameron, when you said that you were going on the on the, the race, but you were with a load of different people that you didn't maybe feel like you had the experience and then compared to doing it on your own when you did it on your own then you came back to do it with a team did it almost feel like oh, i kind of want to like i want to do it on my own i want to you know yeah is I it mean, hard to, to go from doing that on your own to doing maybe the same kind of as thing sailors we're never happy there's either right. too much wind not enough wind the wrong type of wind wrong direction and it's a little bit so global challenge exactly as comrade said you've got these very successful business people that have paid for this opportunity of a lifetime to go around the world that you're now responsible for and hoping to lead and it is very lonely at the top and I learned that the hard way you know I thought I should be everyone's friend but that's not how you lead somebody so I learned about leadership there then you go on your own and you get used to doing everything your way and you are responsible for everything the good and the bad and then you come back into a team environment and I went in to be part of a team and you have to remember to only do your job because if right. you do your job to 100 percent, it allows everyone around you to do their yeah. jobs but you can't keep stepping on toes because yeah. so actually you have to learn how to fit into that and it must be hard to not team a little toes, bit but then i learned a lot from that experience to take on when i then right. led the team of how right. to empower them to get the most out of it yeah so it's all kind of learnings along the yeah. way yeah it's it's very situation leadership is very situational uh, and you know if, when you're leading a Vendée Globe team you're so reliant on people doing their job two three five thousand miles away from you and and actually your life depends on their ability to be motivated when you're not around because actually even the, despite having you know good communications you know you're not on the shop floor giving someone a pep talk or a yeah. pat on the back and the same for yourself you know it's very difficult to motivate yourself um, you know you have to learn to reward yourself when you're on your own you have to yeah. learn to sort of say well done you did a good job today um, I, I can be 
very critical of myself when I'm on my own. And I think quite a lot of high performance sports people tend to be quite driven that way, yeah. but they forget to to give themselves a break and, and reward. And, and I think that was the greatest thing that I learned on the Vendée was how to uh, actually say well done to yourself. Yeah. You know, you made a few miles or, or, or not be too hard. And it actually took a major incident in the race for that to happen. Um, as uh, some people will know, I, you know, I broke my rudder and ended up limping into Cape Town to make repairs. And it put me not just at the back of the fleet, but 500 miles behind the last place boat. And so when I set out from Cape Town, I, you know, I was never going to win the race. And, uh, and so I had to kind of just reevaluate why I was out there and what I was doing. Yeah. And, uh, and you ended up finishing quite high. And it ended up finishing quite high, but yeah. more importantly, ended up silencing the, the, you know, the sort of the yeah. negative demons yeah. that were on my shoulder going, you know, you know, being lazy or you haven't tried hard enough, you're not pushing hard enough, um, but, but, but never saying well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. My next question was kind of being going to be when you go on these races and these, these trips, like obviously you're at the mercy of, of the ocean, like have you got any? Oh, mother really, nature yeah. really yeah. lets you know she's in charge. Yeah. Every time you think you've got things sussed, you throw a curveball yeah. in and, and actually, you know, between us, we've got a lot of laps that span a, few decades now I've had to say and every lap is different like we are seeing things changing yeah you know the weather systems are very different to yeah. what we had before the ice limits um to keep us safe you know originally when we went round global challenge Whitbread day wrong way round, there was no ice limit you could go where right. you liked you know and we saw ice yeah and now we have ice limits for the ocean race and the Vendée globe to keep us safe but they're getting further and further north as conditions are changing which men mean that the weather systems we're encountering are so different so it's you're always learning that's why we keep going back out to sea because it's such a variable environment yeah. but it, it really is evolving you know when people talk about the changes in the climate we're yeah. seeing it yeah definitely and it's it's a different a kind of a different viewpoint because obviously you're you're racing in the ocean but you're still seeing like these changes happening that the same way that scientists are seeing them mm. happening it's yeah, I mean, you know, there was when, when back in 93, we'd go into the Southern Ocean, big, long Southern Ocean legs, and you'd have 14, 15 days of winds, 25 to 35 yeah. knots, um, big, big seas. And, you know, I've been following the last few editions of, of the race, and, you know, they're getting big calm spots, um, big high pressure areas dominating for large periods of time. It's, it's, it's very different. Some people will be familiar with the Sydney Hobart race. And you know, typically on a Sydney Hobart, you'd leave Sydney, you'd sail down the East Australian coast, and you'd be met by a, a southerly change at some point, quite yeah. often across the Bass Strait. Um, but because all of the weather systems are sort of deep south, yeah. um, we're seeing a lot of records being smashed in that, in that race because it's a sleigh ride all the way right. in the northeasters. And we're not getting this this southerly change, right? Um, and so, undoubtedly, you know, the weather is having a big impact yeah. on ocean racing. I'm guessing the whole of sailing in general is adapting to what the ocean does. And it goes all the way through from your decisions at design process, because what you do is you take historical data, like the 20 years of weather to go around the world. Mm. And, and you make decisions based on, oh, in the Southern Ocean, it's going to be downwind in 25 knots. Well, the average wind speed now to go around the world is something like 17 knots, wow. which is nothing. And yes, you will get your 50 knot blast, but it's not consistently in the Southern yeah. Ocean. It'd be like near the Falklands as you come out right. or across the North Atlantic right. as you come across. And so design and sail choices are then now changing and evolving. And right. it, it's a real different game now, I think. Very much so, and particularly with the new technologies, boats that are now popping up on these little hydrofoils, uh, you know, you're, you're effectively trying to manage risk around the world and, and not, not build something that is kind of Southern Ocean bomb-proof. Um, but, but occasionally they're going to get that wrong. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen you know, a real difference in design philosophy because 
of, of the data, but the data is not, you know, on any particular year. It's, there's a lot of inconsistencies now yeah. with what we're seeing. Yeah, and, and 20 years of past data is great, but actually the speed of change in the last few years is really rapid. Yeah. So actually 20 years of data is not any good for what you're going to get yeah. next year. Or if you're planning the next Bond Day Globe in 2024 yeah. or 2028, you want to be looking at weather now yeah, because no. it's changing it's so fast. Then harder to plan because you're only using a smaller amount of data yeah. compared to when you'd be able to yeah. use on, 20 years. On the positive side, though, new parts of the world are opening up. I mean, who'd ever thought that we'd be racing to the you know, northern round Greenland and, and yeah. Iceland and, and these sorts of places? And they're actually quite interesting racetracks mm. and take you across multiple weather systems and uh, would have been deemed perhaps too dangerous to do that yeah. sort of sailing and now the high latitude stuff is is probably the new frontier right and we, we talked about like the extreme weather conditions like what is it like being out on the ocean and you've got these extreme sort of weather yeah. facing you like what what is it like how how, how can you sort of keep keep calm because i can imagine like it must be so terrifying being on a boat of that size and you're you're in the middle of the ocean and it, waves and it doesn't come as a surprise so we've got a lot of technology now that helps us the weather yeah. forecasting is so much better and you get the confidence when the models agree and you know it's coming and you try and position yourself depending on what boat you're sailing yeah. to be in the best place to take right. it on and you look for the changes you know like Everybody does. You know, you don't just use the data. You look outside, you see the clouds change, you see the waves change, you see the wind shift. You can feel the temperature change, the barometer drops. You know, still traditional methods are used and yeah. we see it happening and you adapt then to the conditions. But open ocean is a safe place to be. It's not that busy. There's not that many hazards. There's not yeah. that much shipping. Yeah. So you've got space, which right. gives you time to manage it. And it never lasts forever. But if you get that um, coming together with some big weather in a coastal situation or like as you come into the English Channel, for example, yeah. you know, you go to the Fastnet Rock and you come back this summer that everyone's going to do in a few weeks. You come back into the English Channel and it's a narrow area with lots of shipping, lots of tidal effects. Suddenly a big weather system there makes it a major yeah. ordeal and yeah. it, the stress levels go up a little yeah. bit. Then. I suppose when you've got two different things sort of combining, it's then... Yeah, you've got lots of things yeah. to worry about rather than yeah. just the weather and the waves. You've got... Yeah land and shipping yeah. and weather and waves and like you met you mentioned when you were on the the Fonday globe and the rudder broke like what how stressful was that having, having to deal with that while at sea like? i mean it was stressful in the sense that you know when you put eight years into yeah. a program and you think that's the end of it um and you know financially it was it, it was a challenge Actually, stopping in Cape Town wasn't really much of an option for us at that, that point. So you're then um, focused on, can I solve this, this issue? Uh, actually surprised ourselves. Um, we both have sailed a lot with uh, Joff Brown as our project manager, and he coached me through that um, incident to, to, to make the change and to replace the rudder at sea or replace the rudder. Um, and then actually feeling really anxious about now I'm 500 miles behind the last place boat about to go into a place where your only safety net is the yeah. fleet around you and uh, that was your incentive to sail fast did I really yeah did I really want to go out into the southern ocean yeah. at the back um, I have huge re respect for Sam we both um, know Sam Davies very well and she she smashed into what was probably um, a whale uh, in, wow. in the southern part of, of, of South Africa and, uh, and put, did a, a lot of structural damage to the boat yeah. and actually went in, repaired the boat, received outside assistance, so therefore couldn't compete right. other than to continue in the race as a sort of a non-classified yeah. and... and to make that decision and to go back out and do that after a big incident like that, uh, it it's takes a lot of guts huge, to do that. huge yeah. amounts of courage. Um, and I, 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 once I'd passed a few boats, I was massively relieved. Yeah. Um, and then I just started just really enjoying myself. But from that moment of leaving Cape Town, I was, uh, yeah, I was quite anxious yeah. about being, you know, so far behind. Yeah, I can imagine. So the next thing I was going to talk about is like, Obviously, you talked a bit about how 
sailing is adapting to how the ocean is changing, but also the sort of the science of the ocean and sailing is sort of mix of it. So you you do you skip the term team turn the tide on plastic? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So we were probably one of the first boats to take kind of citizen science yeah. on board. So we we were sponsored by the UN Clean Seas Initiative, and uh, our main kind of message was turn the tide on plastic. So addressing single use plastics. And we took um, new technology that allowed us to use um, water from beneath the boat as we were going to make fresh water, but we took it in through a machine that had um, different levels of filters so that we could test for microplastics. Right. So one of the nice things about ocean racing yachts is they go to areas of the planet that most scientists can't get to and without having to pay to get yeah. there because it's quite hard to yeah. access these areas. And every day we're making fresh water so that we can eat and drink. So we did it in a system so that each day we would take these this data and seal the filters and record it. And every leg would give our filters into the scientists. Yeah. And it went to GOMAR and they analyzed these filters. And at the time they were, they were having to create the technology to analyze the microplastics because it was like chicken and egg, you know, yeah. like, we've got this information, yeah. how do we test it? And that evolved. So at the end of the round the world race, we had the first data of this is where microplastics and how much microplastics are present in the world's ocean. And it was interesting. There were literally three areas that didn't have microplastics. Like even in the Southern Ocean, remote parts of the Southern Ocean, they were present and there isn't a lot of traffic down there. Right. Um, the three areas were the Falkland Islands, the, just south of the Australian Bight and um, the west coast of Ireland. So everyone goes, oh, aren't we great? You know, the Irish are like, way. <laughs> but actually what we learn is it's the ocean currents that are right. really dominant. So the Gulf Stream moves everything past Ireland. And so it made Norway look really bad because actually right. it was just moving all the microplastics yeah. to another area. Oh, okay. And the reason there's so much in the Southern Ocean was it's that current flow of currents that yeah. are bringing it down there. It's yeah. not like there's a lot of traffic. Right. But the reality was that everywhere around the world were microplastics present. So now we've got kind of baseline data. What they're doing now is the recent edition of the Ocean Race, again, had boats going around testing the water and they are now testing different profiles, but it allows a comparison to happen. You know, right. is what we're doing making things better or is thing, are things getting worse? Is there, where yeah. are we at? And um, I think, you know, every race now and sailing as a sport is really taking responsibility that we have the ocean as our playground and our office and our racetrack yeah. and we have a responsibility to try and help protect it yeah. and learn about it educate people and support the science that can help facilitate change yeah i was going to say do you expect this kind of thing to be happening more with the with the ocean race specifically but then sailing in general do you, do you see I it think, developing I think that way sports yeah. generally is has, has found a, a pathway to um particularly some of the clean sports um adventurous sports uh to link with a strong environmental message um, but we're also seeing particularly with sailing it's a great team sport it's a level playing field yeah. in terms that you know women can compete with men it, it, on equal terms yeah uh, at really equal terms you know that it doesn't have to be um you know m massive changes to equipment and so on to yeah uh, and that and that means that it's a it's a it's a great platform yeah for um for companies to get you know, their, their messaging across. You know, I, w one thing I loved about the BT Global Challenge was, you know, we sailed as mixed teams. Very few teams at that stage in any sport um, are, are mixed. Yeah. And w without doubt, in my mind, the performance of our team it was hugely enhanced by being mixed. Uh, most of the senior people on our boat were female. Right. Um, female, very good uh, at endurance events. Um, and I, I saw firsthand, you know, some some pretty tired males on the rail, but you know, I never really saw that with with the females. I always found another gear, and uh, and so, yeah, sailing's so great as an environmental sport, but also you know as a diverse sport. That's really good. So advent adventures coming up for both of you. Do you want to tell us a bit about the, the bounty project? Yeah, well, it's funny how we were just talking about the technology. And yeah. So, of course, you know, if we go back in time to uh, to the days of Captain Cook and yeah. Captain and, and Lieutenant Bly, I mean, these were incredible 
scientists, navigators, um, who you know really were were paving the way for for places like this. Um, you know, some of these these institutions were founded off the back. I mean, we talk a lot about Darwin's anniversary coming up in in six or seven years' time. Of course. Darwin set off with um, Robert Fitzroy, who founded the Met Office. I mean, you know, there's so m many connections yeah. with them. Um, so to find myself on a uh, cast adrift on a little lugger in the middle of the South Pacific, following in, in, in Lieutenant Bly's footsteps was, was actually probably, if I look at it, a nat the natural course of where my career was. I was, was going to mention the Channel 4 show going, today. It, you know, it was interesting, we were making... Uh, a Channel 4 series um, to see if, if humans could endure the same ordeal that Bly's men went through. But actually, it's really struck a chord with me. Right. Um, I, I wasn't super interested in, in history um, growing up. But, uh, but when you start to research these, these stories and you realise you know, that actually they really paved the way for what we now take for granted... Um, it's important to sometimes look at history and learn, yeah. learn the lessons. And, and now more than ever do we need to be learning some lessons, yeah. particularly about the last 200 years. I mean, I'd like to, to set off in perhaps the footsteps of Darwin, and, uh, but sadly, you know, what would you be measuring 200 years mm. later? You know, demise of species, yeah. um, you know, changes in ocean, ocean circulation. I mean, yes it's um it's a really important kind of crit critical time the sailing is very different it's not quite the the high speed <laughs> end um zipping around the planet and i'm still struggling a little bit with going at five knots um, <laughs> in any direction um but it but it you know you realize that actually you know sometimes it's uh, yeah. it's good to, you know we need to take the pace out of the planet a little bit yeah. and slow things down. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be crewing yeah, off. I was going to ask, what, is, what, what was it like filming that show? Because obviously you've, you've said a lot, but it must be a very different experience when you've got, you know, you've been filmed and, and you're on, obviously it's extreme anyway because you're on... Well, it's, a, it's about human personality yeah. and, and, and really that was the main story is uh, um, Channel 4... I think we're perhaps worried that if you put a group of professional sailors together, it wouldn't actually be that interesting telly. So they deliberately made it a bit more challenging uh, by, by, by creating a, a mix of people, obviously led by Ant Middleton, um, who some of you all know is a, a special forces guy, um, not, not uh, a sailor. Uh, and so, you know, I was on, on board as the professional skipper to, to ensure we, you know, we got there. Yeah. Um, it, but it was all about characters and personalities, and uh, there's no better place than to put a bunch of weirdos on a boat, <laughs> cast them adrift, and see how they get on. And, and the great thing is, is you know, we can endure hardship. You know, but quite a lot in life, we, you know, if we think about our political situation at the moment, you know, we're scared of telling people the truth. We're scared of, you know, of of saying actually we're going to make ourselves. You know, worse off to get, you know, the, the planet turned around, but we have to make those choices. Yeah, absolutely have to. Yeah, you know, we can, you know, withstand some of these changes, but we need to make that change. Yeah, definitely. And Dee, obviously, you've been working the ocean race recently. What, what, what have you? Yeah. Out? Well, next for me, I'm going to the other extreme of Comrades Five Knots. I'm trying to go as fast as possible. Right. On a multi hull so i've joined the famous project and our ambition is to do a jules verne record attempt which is basically a speed record around right. the world the record currently sits at 40 days 23 hours we have got the exact same boat that did holds that record it's held it for seven years and we're going to try and do it with a all-female crew because right. it hasn't actually been done with a female crew right 25 years ago tracy edwards led royal sun alliance to try this and they dismasted at cape horn so they never finished. So 25 years later, uh, French skipper Alexia Barry has put the project together that I'm joining her on. And we're going to take a female team and try and yeah. achieve this. But as we're saying and noticing the weather systems and our climate is changing, that I don't even know if it's still possible to have the right wind conditions to 
get the right, right speeds to break a record around the world. Yeah. But if we complete it, which of course we will, <laughs> we'll set a reference time for a female crew and then we'll worry about how fast we're going after that. All right. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. But yeah, thank you guys for, for joining us. It's a really interesting conversation and um, yeah, I'm sure our listeners want to sort of follow the Famous Project and the Bacon Project as well and make sure to sort of find out whether you do, which, which I'm sure you will. If you want to find out more about Dean Conrad, uh, we'll have links in our description. And if you're enjoying the Into the Blue podcast, make sure to subscribe on your favourite podcast app to make sure to not miss out on future episodes. We'll see you soon.